This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 9 for May 22 to 28, Covenant Sign. And this week's lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that Jesus came and died, that each of us could have eternal life. And whether we're listening in Barbados or in Durban or in Paris or in Iran or Washington or anywhere in the world, whether it be Alice Springs in the centre of Australia, we just thank you for your love. And we pray that as we study this week's lesson, which has to do with the Sabbath, we pray that your Spirit will guide us and bless us, and that our understanding of who you are will grow even more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Let's read that again. Exodus 31 and verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. The seventh-day Sabbath is like a nail that, thwack, with unbroken regularity, returns us each week to the foundation of all that we are or could be. We are so busy running to and fro, spending money, making money, going here, going there, going everywhere, and then, thwack, Sabbath comes and reattaches us to our foundation, the starting point of everything that follows. Because everything that is anything to us becomes that only because God created it and us to begin with. With unceasing regularity and with no exceptions, the Sabbath silently hurls over the horizon and into every crack and cranny of our lives. It reminds us that every crack and cranny belongs to our Maker, the One who puts us here, the One who, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth, an act that remains the irrefutable foundation of all Christian belief, and of which the Seventh-day Sabbath, thwack, is the irrefutable, unobtrusive, and unyielding sign. This week, we look at this sign in the context of the Sinai Covenant. And so, for the week at a glance, where does the Sabbath have its origins? What evidence proves that the Sabbath existed before Sinai? What makes the Sabbath such an appropriate covenant sign? Sunday, May 23, Origins. How often we hear the phrase, the old Jewish Sabbath. Yet, Scripture is clear that the Sabbath existed long before there were any Jewish people. Its origin is found in the creation week itself. Look up Genesis 2, 2 and 3 and Exodus 20, verse 11. Where do they clearly and unambiguously place the origin of the Sabbath? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 2, And on the seventh day God entered his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord God blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Although Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, does not identify the seventh day as the Sabbath, this identification comes first in Exodus 16, 26 and 29, it is clearly suggested in the phrase, He rested on the seventh day, in verse 2. Let's have a look at Exodus 16, verses 26 and 29. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. 
See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. The word rested in Genesis 2, the Hebrew word Shabbat, is closely related to the noun Sabbath, the Hebrew Shabbat. The word Sabbath we read in the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible by G. F. Waterman, page 183 of volume 5. The word Sabbath is not employed in Genesis 2, 2 and 3, but it is certain that the author meant to assert that God blessed and hallowed the seventh day as the Sabbath. End of quote. Evidently, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, teaches the divine origin and institution of the Sabbath as a day of blessing for all humanity. Read Mark 2, verse 27, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus says that Sabbath was made for literally man, meaning humanity as a whole, as opposed to the Jews alone. Why would God himself rest on the seventh day? Did he need it? What other purpose might his resting have served? Although some commentators have suggested that God needed physical rest after creation, the true purpose of God in resting was to provide a divine example for humanity. Humankind also is to work for six days and then to rest on the seventh day Sabbath. Theologian Karl Barth suggested that God's resting at the end of creation was a part of the covenant of grace, in which humankind was invited to rest with him, to participate in God's rest. From Church Dogmatics, Volume 3, page 98. God in his love called the man and the woman on the day after their creation to fellowship in rest, to establish intimate communion with him in whose image they had been made. That fellowship and communion was to last forever. Since the fall of humankind, the Sabbath has offered a weekly high point in one's life with the Saviour. And so to finish the day, if someone were to ask you, how has keeping the Sabbath benefited your relationship with the Lord? How would you respond? Monday, May 24. Sabbath before Sinai. And our text for today is Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Skim through Exodus 16, the story of the manna provided to Israel in the desert before Sinai. Notice what this account reveals. 1. Only a regular portion of manna could be used each day, but on the sixth day a double portion was to be gathered. 2. No manna was given on the Sabbath. and 3. The extra portion needed for the Sabbath was preserved from the sixth day unspoiled while the manna would not keep on any other day. Let's read the whole chapter. Exodus 16, beginning at verse 1. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears our complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you made against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quail came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered, some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered every morning every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called its name manna. And it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer of manna in it, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel ate manna forty years." 
until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. What does this story reveal about the sanctity of the Sabbath before the giving of the law on Sinai? Let's just review Exodus 16, verses 23 to 28. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? G. F. Waterman, writing in the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, Volume 5, page 184, writes, In fact, the equation of the Sabbath with the seventh day, the statement that the Lord gave the Israelites the Sabbath, and the record that the people, at God's command, rested on the seventh day, all point unmistakably to the primeval, at creation, institution of the Sabbath. End of quote. There's a lot more about the Sabbath in Exodus 16 than first meets the eye. Look at the questions this passage answers for us. 1. Which day is the preparation day for the Sabbath? 2. Which day of the week is the Sabbath? 3. Where did the Sabbath come from? 4. What kind of day should the Sabbath be? 5. Is the Sabbath a day of fasting? 6. Is the Sabbath a test of loyalty to God? And so to finish the day, how does your understanding of the Sabbath today match with what is taught about the Sabbath in Exodus 16? Tuesday, May 25, Covenant Sign. Our text for today is Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Four times in Scripture, the Sabbath is designated as a sign. We read it in Exodus 31, verse 13, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And verse 20 which reads, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. A sign is not a symbol in the sense of a thing that naturally typifies, represents, or recalls something else, because both share similar qualities. For example, a symbol of a fist often denotes might or power. In the Bible, the Sabbath as a sign functioned as an outward mark or object or condition intended to convey a distinctive message. Nothing in the sign itself particularly linked it to the covenant. 
The Sabbath was a covenant sign between me and you throughout your generations, as it said in Exodus 31 verse 13, only because God said it was. Why would the Lord use the Sabbath as a covenant sign? What is it about the Sabbath that would make it so appropriate as a symbol of the saving relationship with God? As we remember that a crucial aspect of the covenant is that we are saved by grace and that works cannot save us, what is it about the Sabbath itself that makes it such a good symbol of that relationship? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And Hebrews 4 verses 1 to 4, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter into that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. What is fascinating about the Sabbath as a sign of the covenant of grace is that for centuries the Jews have understood the Sabbath to be the sign of messianic redemption. They saw in the Sabbath a foretaste of salvation in the Messiah. Because we understand redemption as coming only from grace, and because we understand the covenant to be a covenant of grace, the link between the Sabbath, redemption and the covenant is made clear, as we see in Deuteronomy 5, verses 13 to 15. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Thus, contrary to common opinion, the Sabbath is a sign of God's saving grace. It's not a sign of salvation by works. And to finish today, how do you understand what it means to rest on the Sabbath. How do you rest on the Sabbath? What do you do differently on that day that makes it a sign? Could someone who knows you look at your life and see that the Sabbath really is a special day for you? Wednesday, May 26, Sign of Sanctification Exodus 31 verse 13 reads, You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. An exceptionally rich Sabbath passage is Exodus chapter 31, beginning at verse 12 and ending in verse 17, which follows the Lord's directions for the building of the sanctuary and the establishment of its services in chapters 25 to 31. Let's read 31, beginning at verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. 
for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The concept of the Sabbath as a sign, a visible, external and eternal sign between God and his people, is expressed here in this manner for the first time. The text itself contains some fascinating concepts worthy of our study. Two new ideas are joined together in this text. One, the Sabbath as a sign of knowledge. And two, the Sabbath as a sign of sanctification. Consider the sign aspect related to knowledge. The Hebrew understanding of knowledge includes intellectual, relational and emotional aspects. To know did not simply mean to know a fact, particularly when a person was involved. It also meant to have a meaningful relationship with the one known. Thus, to know the Lord meant to be in a right relationship with him to serve him, as we find in First Chronicles 28 verse 9, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches our hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will cast you off for ever. To fear him, in Isaiah 11 verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. To believe him, in Isaiah 43 verse 10, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. To trust him and seek him, as we read in Psalm 9 verse 10, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And to call on his name, Jeremiah 10 and verse 25. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you, and on the families who do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him, and made his dwelling place desolate. Question. Look up each of the texts in the above paragraph, which we've just done. In what ways do these texts help us to understand what it means to know the Lord? In addition, the Sabbath has significance as a sign of sanctification. It signifies that the Lord sanctifies his people, as we read in Leviticus 20 and verse 8, And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you by making them holy, as we read in Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The sanctification process is as much the work of God's redemptive love as is the saving and redeeming work of God. Righteousness, or justification, and sanctification are both activities of God. Leviticus 20 verse 8, we read, I, the Lord, sanctify you. Thus, the Sabbath is a sign that imparts the knowledge of God as sanctifier. Ellen White comments in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 350. The Sabbath, given to the world as the sign of God as the Creator, is also the sign of Him as the Sanctifier. And to finish today, consider the Sabbath day and the process of sanctification, that of being made holy. What role does Sabbath keeping have in this process? How can the Lord use our experience of keeping the Sabbath to help sanctify us?
Thursday, May 27. Remembering the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it reads in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. The Sabbath was and is a sign for humanity to remember. The use of the word remember can serve various functions. First, to remember something implies looking backward, looking to the past. In this case, the Sabbath points us to the fiat creation, which climaxed in the institution of the Sabbath as a weekly day of rest and special communion with God. The injunction to remember also has implications for the present. We are not only just to remember the Sabbath, as we've just read in Exodus 20 verse 8, we also are to observe and keep it, as we see in Deuteronomy 5 Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Thus, the Sabbath has important implications for us now, in the present. Finally, remembering the Sabbath also points us forward. The person who remembers the keeping of the Sabbath has a promising, rich and meaningful future with the Lord of the Sabbath. He or she remains in the covenant relationship because he or she remains in the Lord. Again, when we understand the covenant to be a relationship between God and humankind, the Sabbath, which greatly can help strengthen that relationship, comes into specific prominence. Indeed, in remembering creation and its creator, God's people also remember God's gracious acts of salvation, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 14, where the Sabbath is seen in this context as a sign of deliverance from Egypt, a symbol of the ultimate salvation found in God. Deuteronomy 5.14 But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Creation and recreation belong together. The former makes the latter possible. The Sabbath is a sign that communicates that God is the creator of the world and the creator of our salvation. And so to finish the day, we begin by reading a quote from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 160. By keeping his Sabbath holy, we are to show that we are his people. His word declares the Sabbath to be a sign by which to distinguish the commandment-keeping people. Those who keep the law of God will be one with him in the great controversy commenced in heaven between Satan and God. End of quote. Look at this statement from the Lord's servant. What is it about the Sabbath that makes it something that can distinguish us as the commandment-keeping people? perhaps more so than any of the other commandments. Friday, May 28. The Ten Commandments define comprehensively and fundamentally the divine human and human-human relationships. The commandment at the centre of the Decalogue is the Sabbath commandment. It identifies the Lord of the Sabbath in a special way and indicates his sphere of authority and ownership. Note these two aspects. 1. The identity of the deity, Yahweh, Lord, who is the creator, as we read in Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And Exodus 31, verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And who thus holds a unique place? Two, the sphere of his ownership and authority. Exodus 20, verse, one, verse 11 again. The heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And once again, Exodus 31, verse 17. 
It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In these two aspects, the Sabbath commandment has the characteristics that are typical of seals of international ancient Near Eastern treaty documents. These seals are typically in the centre of the treaty documents and also contain 1. the identity of a deity, usually a pagan god, and 2. the sphere of ownership and authority, usually a limited geographical area. And from the Ellen G. White comments from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 980 and 981, we read, The sanctification of the Spirit signalizes the difference between those who have the seal of God and those who keep a spurious rest day. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. God has designated the seventh day as his Sabbath, as we read in Exodus 31.13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And verse 16, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Thus the distinction is drawn between the loyal and the disloyal. Those who desire to have the seal of God in their foreheads must keep the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Read Leviticus 19, verse 30. Notice how it links the sanctuary and the Sabbath. Considering what we have learned so far about what the Sabbath is a sign of, why does that linkage make so much sense? Leviticus 19 and verse 30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. 2. Ask yourself this question. Has Sabbath-keeping helped strengthen my walk with the Lord? If not, what changes can you make? And now for a summary of this week's lesson. The Sabbath is a covenant sign that reaches forward to the time when the plan of salvation will be consummated. It points back to creation, and as a sign of the covenant of grace, it points us to the final recreation, when God makes all things new. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Balling Tattoo Artist, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Dr. Hernando Diaz was assisting a patient at the Adventist Medical Center in Melodon, Colombia, when a shadowy figure at his office door startled him. It was a shaven-headed man covered with explicit tattoos. Tattoos formed a black and blue web over his head. Tattoos covered his arms and hands. "'It's my turn to see you,' the man declared. "'Please wait for your turn,' Hernando said. Several minutes later, the man entered the office and immediately broke into tears. The big, burly bloke was bawling like a baby." Hernando looked at the man's paperwork. It said he was HIV positive. I don't want to have HIV, the man said, tears streaming down his tattooed cheeks. What happened? Hernando asked. What do you do? I'm a tattoo artist and the body is my canvas, the man said. How did you contact HIV? Are you promiscuous or a homosexual? The man said he was neither and had contracted... HIV through his work. But I don't want HIV, he said. I don't want to die. There is someone who can heal you, Hernando said. I know you may not believe in God, but he can help you. The man acknowledged being an atheist, but he was willing to reconsider. Do you want me to pray for you, Hernando said. Do you want to accept Jesus as your saviour? 
Yes, the man said, weeping. Hernando led the man through the sinner's prayer. When the man said Jesus' name at the end, he fell to the floor. Hernando sent the tattoo artist away for a second HIV test. The next week, the man returned with a happy grin on his face. I don't have HIV, he said. I want to give thanks to God and you because God has healed me. Follow-up testing had given him a clean bill of health. He considered his HIV negative status to be a miracle from God. Months later, Hernando and his wife, Erica, were shopping at a mall when they heard someone screaming, Doctor! Doctor! The tattoo artist ran over to Hernando and lifted him off the ground in an enormous bear hug. He praised God for working a miracle in his life. The tattoo artist is one of dozens of people led to Jesus by Hernando, a 60-year-old Seventh-day Adventist physician serving at the Adventist Medical Centre on the campus of Columbia Adventist University in Medellin. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a missionary training centre at Columbia Adventist University. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.